Hi, everybody. Um, welcome today. Uh, my name is Vanessa Stoby, and I'm honored to be here to start this uh, very important panel led by youth and actually put together by youth. Uh, it's called All In This Together. And uh, the purpose of this is actually to have a very frank and real discussion about anti-Black racism in our schools. And from here forth, uh, I just want to go over a bit of the rules in terms of what's happening today. So we have this on Facebook Live and we do on YouTube Live at this moment. In terms of the, the guests that are here today on the Zoom link with us, uh, we welcome them. And how it will work is that the first 60 minutes will actually be our panelists who will be asked questions by our wonderful moderator, Josie Rose. And we're going to go through some important discussions and some very um, essential points uh, with the youth who are both here from the York Catholic District School Board and the York uh, District School Board themselves. So but we have representation um, from, from both boards. The, then the last bit of the panel, which is the last 15 minutes, we'll, we'll have the ability for the, the youth to take questions from the, the people here today on the Zoom link. And uh, that's an important piece of, of the work that we're doing. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd actually like to welcome um, Josie Rose, who is one of the adult mentors of this group with myself, uh, Vanessa Stoby. Uh, Josie Rose is an incredible human being and uh, works tirelessly in uh, social justice and, and work of anti-Black racism and work around York Region for students and youth. Uh, so Josie, with no other further ado, I would like to welcome you. Well, thank you, Vanessa, for that um, great introduction. And as um, Vanessa, along with uh, three other um, wonderful women or two other wonderful women, um, Jacqueline Wong, and then also um, uh, Kendra Shea Marie Mullins, um, we both, uh, we all mentor these fantastic youth. Um, you'll see how fantastic they are. They inspire me every single day. Um, what, working with them on these different initiatives. So I'm really happy for everybody that's here today. Um, before we get started and before I acknowledge and um, welcome all of you, I do want to do the land acknowledgement. So I'm asking um, Jayla if she can do that first. Hello, everyone. My name is Jayla Hall. Greet you all. God bless. Um, land acknowledgement. We would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence here continues to this day. We would also like to acknowledge that this is the treaty lands of the First Nations of the Williams Treaty. Thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. We would also like to acknowledge the Chippewas of Georgina Island, First Nations, our closest First Nation community, and our partners in education. We also acknowledge that those who came here involuntarily, particularly forcibly displanted Africans, brought here as a result from the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. And now reading the anti-racism, anti-oppression, solidarity statements. We observe a moment of silence to honor those who have led lives of service. Those who have stood up for social and economic justice, have sacrificed so that we may be here, have confronted and dismantled oppressive practices and institutions, and have built affirming and equitable examples to inspire us all. You who stood against economic exploitation, homophobia, racism, gender discrimination, religious bigotry, and other oppressive forces, we stand on your sturdy, courageous shoulders. We thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jayla. Um, so I do want to welcome um, all of you to this call. Um, I'm so excited about today and thank you for coming to listen to the youth um, regarding a lot of the issues that they're dealing with within the school boards um, when it comes to anti-Black racism. So I do want to welcome um, both directors from the different um, school boards. For, so Louise Ceresco, um, director of the York Region District School Board. And then I also want to welcome Mary Batista, the interim director from the York Catholic District School Board. And I also want to say thanks for Cecil, um, the superintendent of Indigenous, Indigenous Education and Equity, and Ricky Verapan, um, superintendent of York Regional Police. Um, again, thank you for being here. And then one of our students, um, who is a co-founder of BYR Youth, Unfortunately, he was not able to attend because he's doing some very exciting things um, 
um, today. So um, Cameron Davis, so I just wanted to say thank you. He's an integral part to um, to this um, to this this uh, committee. And then also I want to um, say thank you to all the Black organizations within York Region that are working tirelessly to combat anti-Black racism um, within the school boards and, and the different systems. So I just want to say thank you to all of those. So before we, so I just want to say thank you again, if I have missed you, because there's so many important people on this call. And again, thank you for taking, you know, two and a half hours out of your day today to come and listen to us um, talk about um, some of the issues that our students are dealing with. So thank you so much. So I do want to now talk about our panelists. Okay, so our panelists are amazing. So the first one is our, our co-founder, uh, one of the co-founders of BYR Youth, who is Sydney Baxter. Sydney is a student from Markham District High School. She has organized a Black Lives, Pro Lives Matter protest in Markham and continues to advocate for Black youth. Then we have Rachel Chung. Uh, Rachel is a student from Pierre Elliott Trudeau High School. She is a youth activist that has spoken on multiple multiple youth panels and events, including the Giants of Africa events and a youth panel on City Line TV. And she is also a co-founder and fantastic ally of um, Black, um, see, BYR youth. Thank you. Then we have Khaled. Khaled is a student attending Stephen Lewis Secondary. He enjoys writing, reading, video games, and the multiple instruments that he enjoys playing. And then we have Patrick Way Skinner, um, who's new to our, our um, committee. And so thank you for being here. Pat Patrick brings to this panel his Jamaican European indigenous cultural um, heritage, and he has extensive community involvement, which includes 500 plus hours of community service at Sacred Heart, um, Catholic High School and the BLM um, keynote address for the Family Connection Community Services of York Region, AGM, and he is the 200 and sorry 2020 recipient of the New Market Mayor's Community Service Award, and he is a member of NACA. So welcome. And then we have Dream Truett, I'm sorry Barnes. And she is a grade 11 student who has been a member of um, BYR Youth for a year. She attends school in Mississauga and has a variety of hobbies, ranging from competitive high school dancing, robotics, to her own podcast. Dream joined BYR Youth because she wants to advocate and to create positive changes for those who have not been able to advocate for themselves. Thank you, Jayla. Um, and sorry, Dream. And then Jayla Hall um, is an entrepreneur, a digital painter, activist, and spoken word artist. Her art and poetry commonly um, speaks on the topics like blackness, activism, fe femininity, faith in God, and the mental health. Her digital art studio is called The Creator House, and she is a member of BYR Youth. And then we have Janae Lane. Janae is a youth activist from Randall Public School. Janae loves sports from gymnastics, volleyball, basketball, and she also loves singing, arts, um, playing piano and flute. She attended the school-led um, Markham Black Lives Matter protest, and she plans to speak at more events in the future. So thank you for that. We are missing one other person that was um, supposed to be on the call, um, Elena, and I forgot her last name. I'm so sorry, but again, she's a grade eight student here at York Region and again, fantastic um, youth. So you see how lucky we are, like these youth, um, the, the bios are just, you know, they don't even tell you half of the stuff that they do within the community. So I just wanna thank them for um, being here today. It is a wonderful panel, thank you. All right, so let's get started. So kind of panels, um, panelists, I don't know if you wanna have your cameras on. 
Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right, so again, we're here to talk about anti-Black racism and how it affects um, our Black students, right, on, on many levels. So the first question, um, I'm going to ask Patrick, if he, what is anti-Black racism, just in case there's some people here on this call that doesn't know. So anti-Black racism is prejudice, attitudes, beliefs, stereotyping, or discrimination that is directed to people of African descent. Okay, thank you for that. And how has colonization um, affected um, school systems today? Who wants to answer that? I can answer that one. Thank you, Sydney. So when we think about schooling in Canada, the first thought that comes to my head is that it was really started by white colonial men. And based off of that, that's what our basically founding blocks of education are here in Canada. So as we, as a society move forward, the school system itself kind of stayed back in the past. And you can see that in the things that we learn today, because there are barely any people of color that we learn about. It's mostly older white men. That is the pinnacle of education. So that is how colonialism really transferred over the years up until today. Thank you for that. Does anybody else want to add any more to that? Okay. So what has our education system done so far to truly represent the impact history has on the present and future? Um, Khaled, I'm, I'm gonna ask you if you can answer that question. Yeah, for sure. So the education education system has not taught students the true gravity of all the things um, of all the things in, the, in our past and how they have the have, how they have a correlation to our present day and our future events. So the system has not shown us the impact of these old day systemic systemic practices that now affect our current societal systems today. And when I'm talking about um, our history, I'm talking about the effects of slavery, the effects of systemic stereotypes and negative stereotypes against. Um, black people, indigenous people, I'm talking about the land distribution that um, took place years ago, where white people mostly got all the land and black people were left with little to none. And the, also the income disparities between black and white people to this day that are still continuing on. And I do believe that if our students were to, believe, to learn the impact of our history and how it has um, massive or huge effects on our present day and how our how, how how we haven't really changed as much as we really think that we have. I believe that that would be a very positive, I don't know how to finish this, but some of these. <laughs> no, that, that was great, um, Khaled. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Do you want to say more? Oh, I'm okay. I, I think I'm. You're done. Okay. Does anybody else want to add to that? I know you guys had a lot to say when we talk about anti-black racism in the schools. Okay. All right. So um, that leads us to our next question, because when we talk about anti-black racism and the, and the incidents um, within the boards, um, what are some personal experiences you have um, with racism in your schools? And in your opinion, what has to change? Sydney, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, I can start with that. So uh, one of the most prevalent experiences that I can remember was from, it was either grade four or five, and it was a social studies class and we were doing this activity where half the class were masters and half the class were servants. And the servants in the class had to do whatever the masters wanted them to do for the day within reason, of course, but still they had to do like whatever they wanted as they were servants. And this was done by a white female teacher in a class of mainly um, people of color. My school was majority South Asian. So to be, I'm pretty sure I was the only black girl in the class. I was also a servant. Um, I was a servant um, classmate. I was the only black girl in the class, if not one of two black kids in the class. And it was very, it was just weird. 
And I, looking back at that, I realized that that is so problematic to be teaching children, you know, like having them actually go through the servant master, like how giving children power over other children. That's just not right. And on top of that, um, some other experiences I had were also in grade four and five, where a teacher I had would constantly pick on me. And she at one point would yell at me to move. And when I was sitting with um, people at lunchtime, she came up to me with another teacher, yelled at me to move. I didn't know what she was referring to. I was moving my chair around. I was, you know, moving the desk. And she made me get up, cornered me in a corner with this teacher alone. There was no one else around and yelled at me for no reason at all that I can really think of. So these are some experiences that I've faced. And I realized that over time that these things weren't right. Because at the time, you know, as a, you know, 12 year old, 11 year old, 10 year old, I'm not thinking about, you know, why am I the only one in the class that she's picking on when everyone else in the class she's fine with? Or why are we doing something that gives students power over each other? I wasn't thinking of these things. And that's a real problem. Thank you, Sydney. That's, that's a difficult story to hear. Um, does anybody else want to share? Yeah, I can add on, actually. Thank you. To be honest, I one of, one of the most prevalent experiences I can think of, I actually didn't remember because it traumatized me a bit to the point where I buried it within my memory up until Sydney was telling that was mentioning that to us, that story to us at a meeting a few days ago. I remember I was in eighth grade, I was 13 years old, and we went to Quebec for our eighth grade grad trip, which everybody knows is supposed to be a really fun trip full of amazing memories. I remember when we went to one of those touring of the towers in Quebec that they used during the war, There, the lady who was giving us the tour was asked if anybody in the class played drums. And at the time I raised my hand because I was a drummer in my class, and she had called me to the front and there was a wooden horse or a wooden figure. And she told, and she handed me a whip and she told me to whip the horse. And for me, that was at the time I couldn't say no because of the fact that I hadn't really grown in my own confidence or my own stage. And when she was explaining why I was, I had to whip it was because that was how they treat people who disrespected um, people in Quebec at the time. So I did it, but I didn't realize the same thing. It, it made me question myself for the rest of the trip if what I did was was detrimental to me in any way. And it really made me just question myself and it had a mental impact on me to the point where I just wanted to forget it. And looking back now, I realized that I should have spoken up, but to anyone who says, why didn't I? It's because I didn't have the same knowledge of what it means to be Black as I do now. I didn't have the same confidence as I do now. And I definitely wouldn't have been able to say anything in front of all my peers, uh, a whole bunch of teachers, and my principal who were all there and saw it with me. Thank you for that um, story, Dream. I'm sorry, again, you had to go through some of that stuff. I'm sure it's really hard as a young um, student dealing with that. Janae. Oh, yes, I can add on to that. Um, so I have a, a few stories. So the first one that happened to me six, seven years ago when I was in grade one. So basically, I was having my birthday party and I invited a lot of people from my class and I invited one of my friends. And then a few days later, she came back to me and she told me, oh, my parents said I can't go to your party because they don't want me going to a black kid's party and that like they don't like black people. And like at the time, since I was only like six, seven, I didn't really like, you know, respond to it because, you know, I kind of like reacted in the way a six year old would respond. So at the time, I never looked at her as my non black friend or I never looked at myself as her black friend. I just looked at my at her as my friend and me being one of the one out of two black kids in the class. It was like really impactful for me. And the second story I could say is like about my hair, because, you know, um, I usually have like in braids or like an afro or a puff or like something that like represents my black culture. And at the time, I was very insecure about it because, you know, I was one of two black kids at, at school in my class. So 
it really like hurt my self-esteem at the time but like now I could say that like I'm more confident in my black roots and my culture all right thank you for that Janae and Patrick okay. As a, as um, from the Catholic board, do you have any stories or any experiences that you would like to share? Um, yeah, I have like a bunch of small stories, but like the overhanging thing is, whenever something would be going on in the school, um, that had to be involved with like teachers coming in, janitorial staff, principals, um. If me or any of my other um, black friends were in that area, we would be the first people to be questioned no matter what. So like, it could have been like down the hall and they'd come to us first questioning, see if we were involved with what was ever, whatever was happening. And it happened like multiple times, multiple occasions. Um, I never really like thought about it, but like looking back, like now, like, I see that like, it was just cause it was racism. Yeah. Right. Thank you for sharing that Patrick. Um, and Khalid as a black male, like how do you have any, as Patrick was saying? Yeah, so most of the stuff that I've experienced are mostly minor in or incidents and it's mostly, uh, it was mostly between students um, that didn't understand the gravity of what they were saying, like calling me the N word, or they would use racial stereotypes in order to um, in order to make me feel like I was not a black person. And so they would say like, "Oh, you don't steal, so you're not black," stuff like that. So they would try to they would try to um, I don't know how to say it, but they would try to, they would try to make fun of me for not following the, the stereotypes and actually being a good student, not doing the stuff that they thought a black person does. But this, but the administration at my school never really did anything to combat that. So that's where my issue with the administration is. Okay, so you you had you both all of you have um, said things that I'm, I just want to go on a little bit. Um, some of you mentioned the effects it has um, anti black racism actually has on you. And does anybody want to share like how do you feel when you have these instances going on? Does anybody want to share that? Yeah, I can elaborate. So it really takes a toll on you because personally for me, adding on to the whole use of the N-word thing, the first time I heard the word was at school. It wasn't from my parents. I didn't even know what the word meant. I couldn't, eat, I, I'd never heard it before. So when you grow up thinking, not, real, not realizing that there's a diff, that you're treated differently because of the way you look. And when you finally realize that it's a big shock and it has a mental toll on you. It makes you think, what? why do I have to be treated differently just because of the way I look? Why do I have to go through these things when other people don't? And like I said, mentally, it just makes you really question yourself, um, who you are as a person, what you should be doing, and how and it makes you be more aware of what you need to do as a Black person just to make sure that you're safe. Yeah. I mean, I as a youth, you're already <laughs> trying to figure out who you are. And then this is just, just an added um, pressure to you. You were going to say something, Sydney? Yeah, I was just going to say to add on to what Dream was saying, it also makes you feel isolated because I know at my school there was a handful of Black students, I'm talking about my elementary school, um, there was incidences of anti-Black racism in elementary and high school, but for this, let me just focus on elementary. So, um, I remember times where students who were not black came up to me and would just say the N word and laugh because they can. And I had, I couldn't say anything. I told them to stop and they would do it to mock me in a way. They would say it to me because they can and they know they can get away with it. And it was really isolating because the other black students were either not around, not in my class, or they were too shy to say anything and they didn't want to say anything so I was really the only black student who would tell kids you know don't say the n-word don't say the n-word and they would constantly say it all the time just because they can so it's very isolating and it makes you feel very alone because I felt very alone 
during all this. And yeah, it's just not a great feeling to know that because of your skin color, because of your ethnicity, people think that they can use certain things against you. They can use certain stereotypes against you. They can say, oh, why don't you like basketball? Why don't you eat fried chicken? Do you like watermelon? And they can just say that to you because they can. They can get away with it. Anybody else have to add on when you talk about mental health? Yes. Yeah, I can add on to it a little bit. Um, I could say that like um, anti-Black racism in schools, it, it really impacts the person who's dealing with it for like the rest of their life. Like, you know, being Black, that's something you can't change. And that's something you're that's something that's a part of you and makes you who you are. And when you have people, you know, saying the N-word to you, making fun of you, trying to mock you for who you are, it really impacts like your life. And when you go on in your future years, you'd always like think back to that and hope that like it would never happen again. Like when you go and look for jobs, when you apply for colleges, university, it's always something you're going to remember like you're going to always be like, oh, maybe the university might not accept me because I have like a name that sounds black. Or maybe my teacher in high school won't like me because I'm black. So it's always something you really think about when, for example, when a teacher yells at you, you always think, oh, is it because I did something or is it because I did something and I'm black? You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's really tough. And, And as you said, it doesn't stop, right? This is really high school. And as you said, it could go into your work go into your university I and mean, I teach at college and I see the impact of what happens to a lot of the black youth in high school. It's following them into their higher education and that feeling of, you know, they, they're not important or they don't belong. Um, Rachel, um, before I go to the next question, um, as an ally, do you witness a lot of, a lot of these things? Cause you do talk about a lot of stories that you see. Right. So clearly I'm not black, but I do see that sometimes in my elementary school, there were some kids that were not black that were using the N word. And I do feel like it's because they honestly didn't know how, how, what big of an impact it had on the black students. And I also feel like all the things that everyone has just said, although there was no often no physical violence involved. Um, For example, with what Khaled said about how he feels like he gets mocked for not fitting the stereotypes of being, uh, the stereotypes of like the stereotypical black person, he feels that, and also what Janae and Sydney said, and Patrick and Dream and Jayla, those things all just lead into a general feeling of unbelonging and feeling like they they don't belong in their schools and that they have this identity issue because they just feel as if am I am I doing it right or why am I not one here those little things add to that and the fact that we only talk about black history in black history month and we only talk about black history in in terms of slavery or something it makes them think, and if when when those black kids don't see themselves in the curriculum, they don't see them their ancestors making changes. They don't see any black inventors, black scientists, or anything. They just feel as if how are they supposed to feel proud of their culture if they're never being shown the best things about their culture, and they're only being shown oh black people were slaves. So I think that's what I have observed as an ally, and I have seen the N-word being used, unfortunately, and I just feel like the schools haven't been doing enough in terms of punishment and education around these things. Yeah, I just wanted to add on that all these cases that we've all talked about, when brought to the administration, they're all um, they're all treated as cases of bullying. When it's not bullying, it's racism and it's prejudice. It needs to be treated as, as that. And students need to be taught to unlearn those things. Right. Thank you for that. That's such a valid point, Khaled. Um, Thank you, Rachel. I know um, Jayla wants to say one more um, thing before we go to the next question. Oh, yeah. It's actually perfect because Khaled was actually just talking about this when it's taken to the the administration and it's seen as bullying when it's just flat out racism. I actually do have a story where in fifth grade, one of my friends and I, also Black, 
uh, we found a sticky note on the floor that said his name on it and literally said, you are a forward, right? And when we took it, we were 11 at the time, and when we took it to the main office, they didn't really treat it as something that was worth paying attention to. To this day, we still don't know who wrote it. It's still anonymous. Um, I think that along with what Rachel and Janae and Dream were saying is that um, when when we experience anti-Black racism as schools, even something as important or something as small as like the most subtle form of microaggression, we need to understand how important it is to protect the dignity in Black children and how to protect the identity in Black children. As you can see, these um, stereotypes and these microaggressions and forms of racism do not only impact students inside the school classroom, but they impact them outside of the school classroom. Not only does it in fact affect mental health, but it affects identity. It affects their sense, our sense of self-worth. I can even um, testify to that because I even remember in fifth grade when stereotypes were big, you know, the idea of um, race and things that correspond to different races were things that were just becoming new to us, even in that time at our young age. So even me being a young black girl and having to go with that stereotype of liking basketball and watermelon, right? Simply because I thought that that was, that's who I was supposed to be as a Black person. And that sort of affected how I saw myself and I, um, in terms of my identity and who I was and who I was supposed to be in society, what I was placed here to do. Like, am I just, are we just placed here to like to play basketball? So do you get what I'm saying? In terms of identity and protecting the dignity of Black children, um, not only do we have to take these things into consideration, these concepts or these forms of racism and microaggression that are implemented into not only the relationships in school, but the school curriculum, when we take these into consideration and talk about how these things actually impact the Black community outside of the classroom, that's when it becomes, um, that's when we're able to see the bigger picture. Thank you for that, Jayla. That was um, fantastic. You, you, well said. So a lot of you spoke about what the schools can do. So do you feel that the school board has done a good job of addressing anti-Black racism within your communities? And if yes, explain. If no, how do you feel the school boards and our education systems can improve on addressing anti-Black racism and discriminations in the system? And I do it. I think it was, yeah. well, it's all of you, whoever wants to talk. Um, so I honestly think that the school board has not done a good job at all with handling anti-Black racism claims from students or um, situations because everyone here goes to a different school and everyone here has a story of not being taken seriously or hearing a, a kid say the N-word and get away with it, essentially. And we all go to different schools, like I just said, that's at least five different schools, if not six different schools, maybe more, two different school boards. And the fact that we are here and we're still experiencing this, I still know kids who are in elementary school right now who they hear the N-word and the teachers, they're like, oh, okay, that's not nice. Don't say that. If we want to stop racism, you have to stop racism. This isn't, you know, don't bully other people. This is racism. Racism perpetuates in society so much and it is so vital to stop, but we can't stop it if it's not taken seriously in schools. If you let kids get away with thinking, I can say the N word, I can say black people should eat fried chicken. If I can say, oh, black guys are only good at rapping in basketball. If you let your students think that and you don't do anything about it, they will continue to carry that mentality with them to high school where they meet more students and share that mentality. And they carry that with them to university where they share with their with other peers, and then the workplace. And then when they're in higher positions, they're going to still have that idea that I can say the N-word. I can think Black people do basketball and drugs and rapping and they're in gangs. And they're going to carry that with them for the rest of their lives. So for the board to not take this seriously from multiple students, almost every black student that I know who I'm friends with has a story of not being taken seriously. I think that that's a serious problem and that they need to be much harder 
with this because this is society we're talking about now. It's not just a school. Thank you, Sydney. Anybody else? Adding on to what Sydney said, I think one of the biggest reasons that anti-Black racism, anti-black racism still occurs in schools is because there's still this stereotype of Black people that students in the schools are not taught is wrong, per se. That being said, for example, at Black History Month, we all know about Martin Luther King Jr. We all know about Rosa Parks. We all know about Harriet Tubman. But what about the others? What about the others like Louis Latimer, who, for example, made the first practical use light bulb? What about Dr. Shirley Jackson? What about all these other Black people, Black heroes in the community that invented things and did things that are contributing to our society that people don't know about? I think one of the, I think if we taught the students about these other Black heroes, not just the ones we hear on a day-to-day basis, I think there would be a bigger respect for the Black culture and Black people in general, and which would help lower the stereotype or at least or erase it or diminish it to some extent. So I really think we need to, I not, I'm not saying Martin Luther King Jr. and Harriet Tubman aren't important, but there are others. They aren't the only Black people who have done amazing things. And I think we need to really push to stop making it seem like they are. Thank you for that dream. That was awesome. And um, Patrick, um, you come from um, the Catholic School Board where, um, you know, it's about um, loving each other and being there for each other. So how do you feel that the school is um, addressing anti-Black racism? Um, Towards the end of me being at the school, there was a very positive change with a lot of that. Um, Black History Month, for example, we had people from our communities that came in and talked to the whole school about their experiences of being Black and the positive things that they've achieved, um, regardless of the discrimination and all that. Um, But the student body was... From elementary school was conditioned, I feel like, and like told these stereotypes that like even at the end when I was leaving, it didn't really get to them because they were so like rooted in what they've been believing since they were like small children. But there was definitely a positive change um, I saw towards the end, and I think it's still going on right now. Thank you, Patrick. So um, does anybody else want to add this or we, or we can go to the next question? Everybody good? All right. So when we talk about um, data on expulsions and suspensions, what is the current situation with dropout rates for minorities in Ontario, uh, specifically high school students? And Jayla, you wanted to take that? Yes, thank you. Um, In terms of expulsion rates, I would like to read part of an article that I found online that says, that actually sort of puts into perspective very quickly what this might look like, you know? Okay, so from 2006 to 2011, the Toronto District School Board documented that 69% of Black students graduated and 20% of Black students dropped out. In comparison, 84% of White students graduated and 87% of other racialized students graduated. As for dropout rates, only 11% of white students and 9% of racialized students dropped out of high schools. Moment. From that same cohort, only 25% of black students were confirmed in Ontario universities, compared to 60% for other racialized students and 47% for white students. Additionally, 43% of black students did not even apply for post-secondary education. This percentage is almost equal to the number of confirmed Black students for Ontario universities and colleges combined. So putting this into perspective, we can see how in the New York Region District School Board, specifically in the GTA, and um, even where we are locally, Mark, um, New Market, things like that, Black students, there's a large disproportionality between um, not just dropout rates, but graduation rates for Black students and other racialized students. And Of course, there is systemic issues at play here. And I believe that one of the greatest systemic issues at play are the sort of relationships that Black students have with their teachers in their classrooms. Because when we consider things like um, even something as simple as a regular student-teacher relationship, how teachers and students um, relate to one another, 
I can even tell from personal experience that oftentimes in the classroom, I wouldn't feel comfortable asking certain questions to certain teachers because I was afraid that if I were to raise my hand and ask a question, if I didn't quite understand something, then I would be seen as, why are you not paying attention? Oh, you have, you lack knowledge. Oh, you need special help. Whereas if one of my white counterparts were to do that, or one of my non-racialized counterparts were to do that, they would be seen as someone who just genuinely needed an answer to the question. But simultaneously, if I were to not answer, if I were to not raise my hand and answer a question or ask a question in that classroom, they would prompt me to ask more questions. And they would, many people um, or many teachers would sort of hide behind that as an excuse as to why I am not reaching or as to why I would not be able to reach my highest position. So um, in terms of systemic issues, Black students and Black teachers, and mainly just students and teachers in general, need to be able to feel safe in the classroom. Not even just in terms of just social, but not just socially, but academically. And that's one of the biggest reasons why there is such a great disproportionality in dropout rates and grad graduation rates for Black students and non and other racialized students compared to non-Black students. Because even just using this example of not being able to raise my hand to ask a simple question without being questioned about my intelligence, these, these are the subtle things that sort of lead Black students astray and sort of um, leave many Black students unmotivated to pursue education. And that is part of the systemic issue. Thank you, Jayla. And those statistics that you had was um, 2011, but they haven't changed, right? And we're in two th it's 10 years later, so it's kind of um, sad. Um, I think okay. that the survey or the article was actually written in around 2017. It was around, it was very recent. So. Okay, it was recent. Okay, great. All right, so Sydney, um, just to add on to that part, I know that... Um, you know, just speaking to you about all this issues, you talk about the domino effect. So can you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, I can talk about the domino effect. So basically oh. what Jayla was saying with regards to uh, dropout rates of black students compared to white students, let's take this, for example, in, um, you know, the GTA, which is where the statistics came from. So if a black student is dropping out at a higher rate than white students, then that's going to continue to add on to um, the systemic racism that we see um, day to day because those students who are dropping out are at a disadvantage compared to only 11% of white students and 9% of other racialized students. So when you add that all up together, you see how the domino effect is that over time, blacks, more black students are dropping out than are going to post-secondary, which means that black people as a whole, they are not going to university at the same rates as other people, such as white people or the other people of color. And when you see that happening, that's directly because the education system failed those students who could have made it, but they didn't have either the resources, the teachers didn't give them the time of day, the board didn't, um, they didn't, the board didn't really get to them in time for them to really be saved out of the trap of um, falling. So I think that there is a domino effect between the two. Okay. And Rachel, I, I, did you want to add to that or did she say it all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'll add to that. Um, I think that it basically starts from the stereotypes that the teachers might have with their black students. And then once those black students feel as if they don't belong in the classroom or their teachers don't like them as much, they start to not like school as much. And when they don't like school as much, they don't try as hard. And when they don't try as hard, they don't do well in elementary school. They don't do well in high school because they feel as if now the teachers believed in them anyway, because this, which stems from the stereotypes and how the teachers were treating them uh, may be worse than the other kids. And then they don't get into university and then it becomes all the statistics that Jayla and Sydney mentioned. And oftentimes this actually feeds the stereotype because we think, oh yeah, well, 
so many black people are not going to university. It must be because, you know, they stereotypes, they don't, they don't work as hard in school. And we think that instead of the real reason, which is they were not believed in, in school. And uh, I don't know if Sydney would like to mention this, but she had a really great story about, oh, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure if she wanted to say this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> I'm not sure. I just remembered like, oh, I don't think you wanted to say this. Sorry. Oh, no, okay. I will. Don't worry. <laughs> Okay, so say it real quick, so we have to go okay, on to the I'll other questions. I'll say it um, yeah. very quickly. So um, back in elementary school, I had uh, my teacher in grade three. She is one of the most amazing, amazing teachers I've had till this day. And there is this, there was this one black, young black child who was in the class. He was a, he was a boy, and she was so, she was such a caring teacher. She cared about all the students. She helped us when we needed help. She was always there for us. I remember her and him had a great like teacher student relationship and she really watched over him. And in, in that classroom, I remember I saw him where she was so happy. He was doing well in school. And then fast forward to grade six, when he was shut down in class, he was always picked on, yelled at by the teacher. I was in the same class as him. And he kind of went into a shell again and, you know, st started not paying attention as much in class, started trying to, you know, um, take on the class clown role instead of what I saw previously, which was actually, you know, paying attention, you know, trying to work hard in the class. And then fast forward to grade eight, when I was in the same class again, he was completely defeated in a way. He didn't seem like the same person from grade, like, obviously we all change and things like that. But the one teacher, I saw the difference from the one teacher who tried her best and tried to give him the support that she needed compared to the teacher that completely shut him down. And that was a real life experience that I saw between the two classes. And not to mention personally myself with that teacher to this day, I still think of her as like one of the best teachers I've ever had. She was there for me. And then in grade six, that teacher also was not there for me, surprisingly. Um, and it did, hurt my relationships with my teachers from that point on because I felt like I would not get a teacher like that again like in grade three. Okay so what I'm hearing from you guys is that it would be nice for teachers to be there and not uh, pathologize you but actually take the time when they see that you need help and I, I and I guess as I was saying before I see this in higher learning as well. A lot of the kids that I teach at, at college and university you can see how defeated they are right, when they haven't had people believe in them throughout their school, the schools. So thank you for bringing that up. I think what we want to see, or the youth is asking for, is the, for teachers to see that, you know, there could be other things impacting that child. So could it be um, mental health? Could it be, you know, poverty? Could it be something else? So thank you for um, that, Sydney and Rachel. So the next question is, um, how can the education around anti-Black racism or anti-Indigenous racism be implemented into the curriculum? Instead of just having anti-Black, sorry, um, Black History Month, what else can the schools do? So for that one, I have Sydney down, but I don't know if anybody else wants to <laughs> say anything. Yeah, because I, I feel like I've been talking so much, so if anyone okay. would like to say anything. <laughs> You can say something. Um, sure. Um, for um, Black history, like we should learn about Black history all year round, except for that one month, 28 days, because I feel like that's not enough for everyone to learn about Black history, because there's lots of Black inventors, um, Black lawyers, Black doctors that we can all learn about. And if we only have one month, we're not going to learn as much as we should. Okay. And Khaled, I saw that you wanted to say something. Yeah, we just, um, overall, we just need more Black role models or Indigenous role models in our um, education system and our curriculum. We need to be able to look up to people of different ethnicities and be able to see that they, they made it, so can I. So I believe that if we, as long as we have, we could, we could keep um, teaching what we keep, what we teach, but we need to show that other ethnicities have done the same thing and other ethnicities have also been um, through, through those adversities and that they've um, surpass them. Adding on to what Khaled is saying, there's a really big power in a mentor. 
So it's nice to be able to go out and find your own mentor, but it'd also be really nice to be able to see them in the school um, in that sense as well. That being said, I've also, I personally have never had a Black teacher, and that's always been something that I always wanted, just to see the mentorship there as well. Okay, thank you for that. And so when we talk about what the schools can do um, and how they're addressing anti-Black racism, we, we want to see accountability, right? So Rachel, can you, I mean, so Khaled, can you just tell us what is accountability and what are you hoping from the teachers or school boards? Uh, yeah, for sure. So when we look at accountability and holding teachers and administrations um, accountable, we look at seeing real world results in what they're doing and their actions to combat anti-Black racism. And we need, we need to, as students, feel those results and we need to be able to witness them. So in, or, in order to hold you guys accountable, you can't just write something on a piece of paper or um, make some rules or something like that and they don't get implemented and we don't see real life changes. We need to be able to see those. We need to be able to ha- held, hold the te- teachers accountable and we need to be able to know what they are doing in order to help our students. Okay. Does anybody want to add more to that? Yeah, I would like to add something mm-hmm. to that. Uh, when um, I think of schools being held accountable, what I haven't seen has been done yet is that they don't actually ask the Black students themselves what we want to see. Uh, during my entire time at York Region District School Board, I haven't been really asked or no one has come up to me, a teacher, administrator, anyone from the board to ask really, you know, hey, as a black student, what do you need to see in your school? What do you, what do you need? What do your classmates, you know, your fellow black students need? No one ever asked any of us that. And I, I know that the board has been um, trying to put things together. They've been trying to um, put out education for teachers. But the one thing that they're missing is the actual Black student voice. Uh, When you're making something to help others, you want to um, ask them what they need. What are the problems that they see? You want their opinion. You can't make something to help someone without asking them what the problem is in the first place. So I think that what the board needs to do for accountability is to actually go into schools and ask Black students, not as of right now, we can't do in person, face to face, but when that's back up, to actually go in schools and ask students, black students, face to face, so you can see their expression, you can hear their voice. That what's going on, like what's happening, is what we're doing. You know, working. Have you seen anything happen in your classes? Have you seen a change? Because if you don't hear it directly from us, you're not going to get the full story. Thank you for that, Sydney. Does anybody else want to say anything here? Okay. So yes, accountability is huge. And I like that you said about hearing the black voice. That is very important, especially the youth. I know there's a lot of um, organizations that are doing things, but actually having the youth at your tables um, and having discussions on how um, anti-black racism is impacting them. And then the strategies that you're creating, how, how it could be implemented so it works for them is very important. So holding um, people accountable is a huge tax. And in order to hold people accountable, we must have a system in order to measure the progress of the work being done. How can we measure the success of anti-Black racism policies and approaches? Honestly, it's exactly what Sydney said, the results. So if asking the students if there's been a change, if they feel there's been a change, how they feel if they're more accepted, if they feel more involved and part of the community. I think that's the best way to go about it as opposed to a census, just because I don't think a census would get all the information, the full story, um, the real feelings, because there's a lot of factors that can play into this, right? So really, I just really think it's what Sydney said. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to add to that? Okay, so... When we talk about um, allyships in schools, um, how can youth be an ally in schools? And if anybody wants to talk on that. 
I know we heard from Rachel, and I'm sure we're going to hear from her in a second. But as a Black student, what would you want from your other white students or for your, your white students or from somebody outside of the Black community? Personally, I don't, I think one of the biggest things is as a Black student, when you encounter something that's racist, you don't want to have to be the one to always stand up for yourself. I'm not saying that you don't want to, you, you want to sit there and let it happen, but it's nice to have some, know that there are other people who have your back too. Somebody else who will stand up for you as well. So it won't just look like you're quote unquote being the angry Black person. Um, that way you have someone in your corner, essentially. It's nice to have that feeling. Right. Anybody else want to add? Uh, yeah, Jayla? I'll take that too. I think that one of the biggest things, and it sort of aligns with what Jane was saying, actually, the concept of being human Google as a Black person, you know, when people want to sort of um, know something, or even in the classroom when you're talking about something uh, pertaining to the curriculum, specifically during Black History Month, and people, you can... <laughs> teachers can mention something as simple as Martin Luther King or the civil rights movement and people look directly at you and they begin to ask you questions. You know, uh, one of the biggest things that I believe that a lot of Black students need to understand is that we are not human Google. It is not always our responsibility to educate others on history that they should already know. And that sort of comes with, uh, that sort of comes with the process of changing the um, the system that we are under so that we can all receive the education that we need um, to dismantle those stigmas behind uh, the expectations of who Black people are meant to be in the classroom. Okay, thank you for that. And Rachel, um, as an ally, so we have a lot of um, different allies on our, our community board, but unfortunately, some of them weren't able to attend today. So everything's going to go to Rachel. But as um, as a um, an ally, what can you do, or what do you feel? Um, yeah, you can do as an ally. So obviously, I can't speak to how or what the Black youth want in an ally, but I think that an ally would be somebody who is willing to fight alongside the Black people and remember that, you know, the Black community can't, community can't just stop because they feel tired of fighting against it. They have to live it every single day. And it's somebody who's willing to confront their own personal biases and prejudice first and is somebody who is willing to educate themselves on the issues, believe that the issues are actually there there, educate themselves, talk to uh, people in the Black community, ask them about the issues, learn about them, and um, also somebody who understands that they can't actually understand how um, the Black community feel, but just to um, give them space to talk, be really good listeners, listen to their struggles, and um, yeah, I think if you want to become a good ally, it's all about what Dream and Sydney were saying before. Also, wait, no, sorry, Dream and Jayla were saying. Also Sydney? Yeah, I think so. Um, we're saying before about how you need to stand by them. And I think that can start in your home. So talking to, um, I would be talking to my parents. I don't, yeah, about how to, how they think about, certain communities and then maybe confronting those prejudices, confronting those biases and talking about them, having those difficult conversations. And it can start from maybe connecting how they have felt towards certain things to the issues that the Black communities are facing. So maybe, for example, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Asian community has been facing a lot of hate. So I can take that and start the conversation with that and connect it back to like oh, well, the Black community actually faces this too. So they actually face this. Racism is actually real and we need to all confront our biases and our prejudice. So I think that's how we start the conversation. I think that's what an ally is. Thank you, Rachel. That was fantastic. All right. So you guys came up with a whole bunch of actionable items um, that you're hoping that um, the school boards and, and the community will implement because um, there's um, other people from the school board that's here today that they would probably get a lot from what you need to say. So how can students, I'm sorry, how can schools create safe spaces for marginalized youth and their allies? 
So Khaled, um, Patrick, or Sydney, I don't know if any of you guys have anything you want to add for that. Um, yeah, I think connecting students with other students that have gone through similar things and experiences um, could help a lot. And also celebrating the cultures that are in our communities more with each other. And yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Khaled, did you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. I think that we need students to, or sorry, we need the school to be the leader in hosting these safe spaces because it shouldn't be on the student to be creating these spaces for them to, for them themselves to talk. It should be up to the school to create, create this, create the space, um, have the, have the meeting, have whatever needs to be done to connect all the students together and be able to talk to each other about the experiences that they face in school and be able to celebrate like who they are and what they do in the school. Okay. So I believe that has to be, sorry, I, I, just, I believe that has to be put on the school and not the students themselves to create these organizations and clubs and stuff like that. I think that has to be put on the school. Okay, thank you. Sydney? Exactly. To add on to what Khaled was saying, there are BSAs, which are Black Student Alliances, that students have to form in their own schools. And basically what they are is they're, it's like an extracurricular group that a teacher that is overseen by, you know, some teachers in the school um, for Black students to have a safe space to talk about things that are bothering them, to talk about the school environment, to talk about, you know, prejudice that they may feel. It's just an all-around safe space. It's also welcome to basically anyone in the school, but majority of people that join BSAs are Black students. And what I've heard from some BSAs is that they were able to, you know, come together and have conversations with their administration to talk about things such as, you know, um, there was a ban on wearing do-rags, which is what some black males wear on their hair to protect their hair because that is, you know, a protective style. And uh, they were banned in one of these high schools in York Region. And the BSA, the Black Student Alliance, they came together and had a meeting with their administration to talk about why is this, um, you know, piece of fabric that is a part of our culture? Why are you banning this in our school? And they were able to, you know, get the administration to unban it and so that it was allowed. And that's basically the power of um, Black Student Voice. But what I've heard is a really big problem is that they're extremely understaffed. That's the first issue, which also ties into what we're talking about earlier about Black students not feeling safe around their teachers because in order to start one of these BSAs, you need to have you know a teacher or a faculty member. And if black students feel like they have no one they can go to at all, then BSAs can't really be formed. So I think that what Khaled said, it should be put on the board to be really pushing for this and to be teaching the staff to actually you know go forward and ask students like, hey, I'm open to making a BSA, like, oh, you know, these issues are important. And just basically um, getting the staff to talk to the students, really, and to make sure that the staff understand the importance of something like a Black Student Alliance within a school. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Rachel, you did have something when it comes to um, school resource officers. Yeah, so I think somebody will add on to me afterwards and give their opinion on how the Black youth feel about this. But in my opinion, so I feel like two months ago, one month ago, I went to a really good event organized by the York Region Police called the Cookie with the Rookie Program. And then I met up with some police officers uh, a few weeks ago, I think, to talk about it. And I thought that the Cookie with the Rookie Program is basically a program where the cops are just wearing their normal clothes and they're just connecting with the youth. And, you know, we share share cookies and food and just like a good conversation, not necessarily about policing or racism or anything, just about anything. I talked to one of the police officers about university and getting a G1 and, you know, so that kind of conversation. So my experience with that was that it really, it humanized the police and made them seem like they weren't just it wasn't a, it wasn't a, they're, they're out to get us kind of situation. Like the police are so scary, but it was more of a, 
the police are just adults that, you know, they're just normal adults and they want to help us. They're in their normal clothes. And in our schools, we don't get any connection with our school resource officers. We have police officers in our school, but I don't know the names of my school resource officers. They show up for an assembly at the beginning of the year and they don't really connect with the youth. And I feel like that is crucial to taking away that tension um, between the Black community, the Indigenous community, and the police. So, And it's not really so much the police at the Cookie with the Rookie program not having uniforms. It's more the lack of connection that the school resource have officers, like they don't, they don't connect with us. They don't talk with us. And I feel like if they did that, it would make, it would break down a lot of those barriers. Um, and that's what I thought. Thank you for that. Um, and I don't know if the black students want to add to that. Yeah, for sure. I would like to add on. So okay. I also believe that the human interaction with our um, resource officers is very important. Um, uh, there are a lot of negative stereotypes placed on police, but there's also a lot of negative stereotypes placed on Black people. And in order for them to understand each other, in order for them to, you know, mend mend um, what has happened in the past, we need to be able to have those conversations and see them as other human beings or as adults just going to their jobs and doing what they need to survive. It it needs to, it needs to we need a relationship with our school resource officers because the school resource officers or the, the resource officers in of my school, they just walk around the school, they talk to each other, they don't really interact with any of the students. So we never get to real, so we never get to have that one-on-one um, -on -one, um, interaction and we never get to understand where they come from, who they are and what they do. So I believe that we need that human interaction in order to def uh, define the stereotypes that are both placed on the police and black people that maybe the police have. Thank you, Khaled. That was fantastic. And then there was one other thing that you guys mentioned was the student trustees. Um, I know you had some questions about who who are they and because you guys have never interacted with them or felt that they've supported you. So can you talk about a little bit about that? And I forgot who was during that conversation. Sydney, I know you're scared to talk because <laughs> you're not monopolizing. Just talk. That's fine. Okay. So uh, personally, throughout my duration, I'm in grade 12. Throughout my duration at York Region District School Board, I've never heard of the student trustees except for this year. I never really interacted with any of them. It was never, I never like the school never really pushed anything that had to do with student trustees. And I didn't really understand what, you know, was their role. So I feel like that's the first thing that schools are not really explaining to students, you know, what the, what the position of student trustee is and like what they're doing for us, because I also don't know what they have done. If, you know, they've done amazing things. I don't know about it. And majority of the students don't know about it either. And I think that if you're voting in a student, because I'm pretty sure it's a vote, if you're voting in a student trustee, you want to know, you know, what are they doing? What, uh, how are they advocating for us? And on top of that, I also know that there is no such thing as a Black student trustee. And um, I, like, there's no position called a Black student trustee. There's um, an Indigenous student trustee, and I don't see a Black student trustee. So... I was just kind of wondering there, you know, since most of the time when I did look at the student trustees, they were not black students. And when you have people who are representing the student population and the black voice is not really represented, it doesn't it it doesn't help us in a way. Like you need to have people that represent us. We need to be represented in the board in a position such as a trust, a student trustee position, because we've seen the results of us not being present in positions of power. We see it every day in multiple areas. And so to have a position open to, you know, students, but our voice still isn't being heard, it kind of it kind of shows that the board hasn't really thought of that as a solution. So with regards to student trustees, I think that the board should um, first help students recognize 
how can you even become student trustee? Because I didn't know that you could become one. I thought that they, would, they were appointed. They need to tell us what they're doing. And they also, I think, personally, that they should implement a Black student trustee so that the Black voice is heard in the board. Thank you so much for that. And we have two minutes. So Janae did want to say something. Oh, yes. I was going to say I basically agree with Sydney. Um, we, pro we most likely should get a Black um, trustee. And we should get to know them more and get to know their role a little bit more so we understand what they do. Okay, thank you for that. No and problem. so we have two more minutes. Does anybody else have anything else that they want to add to this before we go to questions from the audience? I hope everything that you had to say. No, you're good. Um, I yeah, guess Rachel? I just have one okay. last thing to say and that is just to uh, thank you everyone for coming because I think that listening and educating yourself and listening to the Black youth is definitely the first step to making change. So thank you. Thank you. Jayla, Jayla were you going to say something? Oh, I was going to say thanks. It was kind of awkward because I was trying to turn my mic on and it didn't work. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. Um, that was fantastic. Um, this is just, I mean, this is our third, I think, um, town hall or whatever you want to call it, discussion. Third, yeah. So um, again, thank you for everybody that was able to come today. So I do want to take some questions um, from the people on the call. And I know um, the, the director from the York Region and District School Board, Luis Rico, would like to ask the first question. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not able to turn on my camera. Oh. Um, let's see if we can, not yet. Okay, I don't know. That's okay. Uh, see your you, picture. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and you can hear my voice. Uh, it is such an honor to be, um, it is such an honor to be with everyone today, and thank you for inviting me and youth. It has been a sincere uh, pleasure to be uh, hearing your voices today and your ideas, it's been it's been difficult uh, to hear your recounts, and it is um, you know my sincere expression of of sadness and apology of the experiences that you've recounted uh, in suffering through anti black racism directed at you personally and being witnessed by um, by your friends and peers. It's not acceptable, and we are absolutely dedicated to dismantling anti-Black racism. Um, you know that uh, uh, YRDSB has, um, has built a strategy um, uh, together with, uh, with youth and members of our Black community leaders. We have a long, long way to go, but I want to assure you that of, of my leadership and the leadership of the senior team, that this is the priority of the board. Um, so the ideas that you have uh, raised today are, are wonderful, and I'd like to continue to pursue and have conversations alongside you. But I do have a question for you. Um, so I think an indicator of success for us is actually increasing the uh, reports from students in regards to um, uh, them reporting uh, events and incidents of anti-Black racism. Uh, because we will then be able to address it uh, directly and uh, immediately. Uh, we know that we've got some, you know, we have our report at tool and we direct students to uh, speak to a trusted caring adult. But I'd really like your opinion on what are what are the barriers for students to report incidents and what ideas do you have to make reporting easier? And what would be some indicators of success for us um, uh, to see um, more incidents reported and um, us being able to, to get to the heart of it? Thanks very much. And before I before I turn the question to you, I just want to also um, uh, point out that uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sinclair is uh, on uh, the, the meeting today, and Dr. Sinclair is uh, one of our trustees on our board. Uh, and also sat as a uh, member in our um, anti-Black racism steering uh, committee. So uh, welcome, Dr. Sinclair, and thank you for being here. So students, over to you with that question. Thank you.
You want to answer that question? Okay, Khaled, thank you. Yeah, sure. So um, I think if you want to get students to report these incidents of um, racism, I think you have to kind of advertise, like, we are going to hear you out if you have an incident of racism that you want to report. You kind of have to advertise to the students that if you hear, if you hear see anything that's racist or that has um, prejudice or negative stereotypes involved in it, that we will listen to you and there's a place for you to talk, talk about it. I think that also comes with having that safe space to talk about um, marginalized communities, marginalized communities and um, issues that they face inside the school. I think that also comes with the school hosting that safe space as well. Yeah, and I also wanted to just add on to that sometimes it's actually the teachers who are the ones also being racist, if not administration. So to really advertise to students that it doesn't matter who in your school is being racist, that we will take action, and that's the key word, action, against anyone who is um, perpetuating racism, and that you show that no matter if it's a staff member, if it is a principal, if it's a student, that you're not going to stand for it because we have not seen that yet. Adding on to what Sydney's saying, it can get really hard to speak up if somebody is in a quote unquote position, higher position of power than you. I think one of the reasons why students don't always speak up is because of A, the fear of not being listened to, B, the fear of that they'll be disregarded or C, the, like, knowing that they've been disregarded in the past and fearing of that happening again repeatedly. So really, just as Sydney said, I think, I think there needs to be placed an emphasis on no matter who it is, we, we are going to listen to you and we are going to fix this problem because we care about your well-being, we care that you feel safe, and we care that you feel acknowledged in the classroom. Thank you. That was really great. Um, yeah, it's, it's not just reporting, it's the follow-through. And I think that's what they're saying, and a safe space to say it. Maybe that's where the school trustees come through. Um, is that, uh, did, does anybody else have anything to add to that before we go to the next person? Okay, so MP Merit um, Styles, your question, please. Hi. Hi, everybody. And uh, first of all, let me just start by thanking the panel for your incredible um, sharing and for being very brave. And I think that was, uh, was really important. Um, I'm the member of provincial parliament for Davenport, and I'm also the official opposition NDP education critic. And I really appreciate the invitation to join you here today. It was, uh, it's been really, really interesting and important. And I also want to share, um, I'm as a past school board trustee at the Toronto District School Board, um, I, I know what's involved, actually, I mean, in, in trying to actually bring student voice into some of those big decisions and how frustrating that can be for students. I really appreciate this opportunity. I think it's super important. Um, and I also want to uh, let you know that um, I've been taking pretty extensive notes here and um, I'm going to share my observations and, and notes with uh, the NDP Black Caucus uh, because we've been working together on a policy around anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism in education system. Uh, we have done quite a bit of outreach and consulting and we're going to keep that up building into the next election. And so I really, um, I will be sharing all of this with them as well so we can continue to like be informed by student voice. Um, which is super important. And um, and I and I guess that, like I do have a question. <laughs> um, but in relation to that, I just wanted to flag that what I've noticed is that people like me, po po political folks, have gotten very good at using the language of anti-black racism, you know, putting in lots of great promises and commitments and in policy to what, what needs to be done and can be done to change things in schools. But what I've found over the last number of years is that with all different parties of different political stripes, is that unless there is actually a commitment to action and investment, these are just words. So I wanna flag that for all of you when you're looking at what you, know, you expect and anticipate from people in positions of power who can make these kinds of calls that, you know, it's like, put your money where your mouth is. You know, it's not enough to just say we're committed to this, although that's important. It really does require, you know, it's like, for example, it's not going to make a lot of difference to have 
uh, a wing of government that's focused on equity and anti-Black racism if there's only two people working there to make it happen, right? So we 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 have to keep an eye on that. It's really important, and I and I um and I think a lot of what you talked about today is is some, reflects some of what I've heard from from uh, youth in other parts of the province as well. I wanted to share that. But my question is this: um, in this moment, like we've heard, you know, there's lots of people talking during the pandemic about how we're all in this together, uh, but lots of other people talking about how the pandemic has really shone a light on inequities that already exist. And I wondered if you would all share with us a little bit about what your experience, if your experience during the pandemic, if you've seen or heard um, that of, you know, an increase in incidents, or if you've seen different ways that anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, you know, are reflected in, um, in the way that education is being conducted right now. And I just wanted to get your, your read on that as we head out of this. I have a bet some legislation I'm bringing forward on Monday where I'm asking the government to center uh, children, youth, and young adults in all our COVID recovery plans. And I think, uh, and so I'm really interested particularly in how you guys might respond to this. Thank you so much again. Who would like to speak? Sydney, do you want to go? Yep, I can answer that question. So over the course of the pandemic, Black students have really, um, due to online learning, have been kind of um, pushed out the classroom even further. So now it's easier to not go to classes because it's just a click away online. And it's easier to fall behind. And what has been happening is that Black students have been uh, falling off, really. And I think that we need to have some sort of way to uh, really track that or to see, you know, um, what has happened really over the course of the pandemic and how it's hit Black families, especially Black students. Because having all these students, you know, not in class or falling off of class or having no motivation to go to class because the teachers didn't care anyways and now it's online. I think that that should be addressed in some way. That's great. And Rachel? Yeah, I guess I just want to add on to what Sydney was saying and it's because the Black community and other uh, marginalized communities are being affected disproportionately because of the parents they don't get enough support in school, then they get lower paying jobs because I don't know, they didn't go to university or something because they didn't get the support and they make less money. So, so then there's that cycle that continues when the kid is at home, they might not have as much help. I mean, if for another family whose parent was getting a, a really good job, they get to work from home or something, they can support their kids at home, especially with the younger younger kids, it's really hard to support them if their parents have to go out and do those long, long jobs or do long shifts or something, which is what they often have to do. And then that effect, like that domino cycle continues because then the black children, they don't have as much support when they're in school. And, and then when they don't have as much support, you know, they're going to start, as Sydney said, falling off and then, you know, falling behind. And so that just continues the cycle. And that's how I think the Black community has been affected more than the other communities. Um, and I feel like it just goes back to equity, giving the Black community extra resources. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rachel. That was fantastic. Um, does anybody else want to answer that question? And before, I just want to say that um, there's a lot of questions that uh, people have um, that they want to ask the youth. So um, we probably are going to be going past um, 2.30. So I'm hoping everybody can still stay on the call and listen to what the youth have to say. Um, so does anybody else want to answer to this question or can we go move forward? Or um, Merritt, were you able to, MP Merritt um, Stiles, were you able to get the answer to your question? That was great. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you okay. very much, both of you. You're welcome. And again, and if anybody has any questions after we finish, we, you guys can always reach out to us and we can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you as well. 
these guys are fantastic and they're always up to speaking to you guys and to anybody at other times. So we have next um, um, an interim director, Mary Bixisa from the um, Catholic board. Thank you. Can you see me? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, students, for inviting me here um, this afternoon. Um, I just want you to know that, you know, we heard your voices and we heard what you are experiencing. And we understand that we need to improve. For sure, we need to improve. And um, I took a lot of notes. Um, I just want I just want you to know that um, in our board, and, and you mentioned this at the beginning, we are focusing on culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy, and we are critically looking at all of our resources um, right now, and um, we're hoping to procure more of these resources. We have an anti-Black racism pillar in our HEDIAC committee. And in fact, uh, Principal um, Wright is here. She's the lead of that pillar, as well as one of our trustees is here today, uh, Chair, Mar sorry, Trustee Marchese, who is um, the trustee representative on that pillar. So I'm glad that they are here and they, they heard your voices. Um, also, our, our chair of the board, uh, Dominic Mazzotta, is here, as well as many other trustees and superintendents. They're, they're here also. But um, so, so it is a focus, our, our, our culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. But I know that we need to do a lot um, with training and uh, especially training to identify anti-Black racism, why it occurs in schools, uh, reflect on the conditions of Black students, and we need to take some tangible actions so that we can improve our school system. Um, so, you know what, I took a lot of notes, and I will be bringing uh, my feedback uh, to, to the board, to our senior team, and to see where we can go from here. But, um, so I have one question for you, um, for the panel. Um, we know that COVID has worsened the inequalities for uh, racialized and marginalized students. And we understand the impact of anti-Black racism on Black mental health. So what more can we do to support your mental health and well-being? Thank you. I can take that one. Thank you, Jayla. I think that one of the biggest things that we can do is be more open to conversation. I believe that being open to conversation and understanding the importance of um, speech, it sounds very simple, but it actually goes a long way, just having those simple conversations of asking, um, are you all right? Do you need anything? Those simple things, especially when it comes to um, students, and I talk about this a lot, but um, and I have been talking about this a lot now. You know, but the relationship. It's important to have proper relationships, even if um, people in positions of authority with the people that are under their authority. So having, especially Black students who have gone um, in the past, have had a lot of negative experiences with people in positions of authority, um, understanding the importance of um, Black mental health also means understanding the importance of being open and being genuine. And even if it means uh, we have to lack formality in some cases, I believe I'm saying that correctly, uh, it goes a long way. So for my, my response, my personal response to that question would just be more open to conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, um, I and uh, Mary, as as I always tell you, um, the, the youth are here, and we can always speak um, later, and uh, especially at our pan panels, and speak to a lot of the um, youth within your school board um, going forward. Yeah. Yes. But thank you. Um, thank you. Khalid, I wanted to, um, Khaled, sorry, I wanted to answer your question as well. Yeah. So um, something that um, I thought in my school was really helpful and I thought was very productive was we had around four lessons. It was around, it was over the course of around like four days and it was, um, 
it was lessons upon uh, it was called uh, responding to issues of racism and it was um lessons that were based on human rights and how they were uh, and how they were violated by um maybe talking talking about negative stereotypes or or um perpetuating racism against other students so uh we had a it was in, it was when we were back in class when we had um when we we're social dist distancing and everything like that but we i felt like my 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 um, students and I had a really good conversation around the topic and it was more like a, it was more like a conversation type of lesson where the teacher would ask a question about how racism and human rights um, correlate and then how like online, online racism, online hatred, or even in school, stuff like that. I felt like that was a very good conversation that we had. And I think that schools should be able to implement this strategy as well, um, having it like um, small lessons to talk about racism in, in order to, in order to understand where people are coming from when they say that they have experienced racism or how they feel when they have experienced racism. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you. I think that's great. Yeah. yeah. We'll probably get more information from you so that we can give it to um, the Catholic Board as well. Um, so the next person is Ricky, um, Superintendent Ricky Verapan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and such a such a wonderful afternoon with incredible discussion. So uh, thank you very, very much. I want to say thank you to the panel and thanks for the kind invitation to have York Regional Police join you today. Um, and I, when I met with some of you last a few weeks ago, I was in my jeans and a t-shirt. And uh, and uh, unfortunately, we have a number of uh, pressing issues happening this weekend in the community, and I've had to be in uniform, but I wanted to be a part of this, um, this incredible session. Um, you know, as both of our directors, uh, Director Batista and, um, and Director Sirisco have spoken about, um, you know, um, helping us understand some of the indicators of success and, and what are some of those barriers. And, and we've, you know, we've identified many barriers with policing, uh, particularly in the schools, the school system, and, and recognizing that we still have lots and lots of work to do at York Regional Police. Um, you know, we, we see this... Um, uh, as a shared responsibility, safety, security, and the well-being of our community. And uh, I would just like to sort of um, add to their remarks and also say that from a York Regional Police perspective, uh, we would like you to con continue to help us understand where some of these barriers are, where we identify them, and how we can work together to eradicate them. Uh, thank you for your, uh, and I know some of these questions have, an have been answered in the subsequent discussions just previous to me coming on. But I thank you for your uh, leadership and um, and for your very very candid uh, conversation. And I look forward to having more of these discussions with you uh, moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, um, Superintendent. And um, just so everybody on this call knows that um, the York Regional Police, we do we are doing a lot of um, youth engagement initiatives right now. And um, this group is going to be like one of the forerunners when it comes to putting the the youth initiatives um, together. So I'm really excited about that going forward. Um, they've already met with um, Superintendent Verapan and others um, to talk about what they wanna see. And they came up with some really exciting things. So I'm excited about that. Um, so the next we have um, Cheryl Yar from um, BFCN. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, BYR Youth uh, for your voice and the invitation this afternoon. It's funny, I know five of the the, uh, the students, the youth that are there today, so it's lovely to see your faces. Um, and, you know, thank you for, for speaking on behalf of so many that have been silenced uh, through various trauma that they've received from institutions that are listening on the call today. Um, a comment with regards to the BSA, um, please don't allow staffing um, concerns to silence the fact that you need to communicate. You need to communicate with people that look like you because they can understand what you're actually going through. So BFCN is offering a platform for you to connect either via um, cross region or across school boards even where you could come together and speak and share and be together and know that your voice 
is being heard. So um, I'm just offering that to you. So Josie, if you're interested, please reach out to BFCN. My question is with regards to kindergarten. My passion is kindergarten and the fact that I believe that the trauma that you are actually experiencing and have experienced can be reduced if education is put into kindergartens and the kindergarten family unit. I would ask you, each of you, what is it that you would do different? What would you tell your parent? What would you tell your educator as your kindergarten self? The trauma that you've been through, the experiences that you've had now in high school, what would you say to your kindergarten self to prevent that from happening? And what would you, would you say to the educators that are on the call that you would like to see changed so that you could go from kindergarten and have a peaceful, safe time during school? I'd love to. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sheila. Did someone else want to go? No. No, you go first. Yeah. I think that if I were to talk to my kindergarten self, I would. And it's funny because I actually do write letters, and I, I, that's, I love to write. I'm a poet, so sometimes I write letters and just don't send them to anyone, but I write them as a way to, um, just, just write. It's one of my creative. Forms, but I think that if I were to write a letter or just talk to my kindergarten self, I would say, as long as you are doing all you can to be who you to be who you are called to be, to be who God called you to be, then someone else's perception of who you are is not your problem to fix. I believe that it's important as Black students to understand that we all have a place. We have a place, especially Black students, where we're in a we're in a world where this world tries so hard to strip us of our identity, our culture. We need to understand that as long as we are being who, we are doing what we can to be who we are called to be, then someone else's perception of who we are is not our problem to face. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I would tell my kindergarten self, that you need to be bold. You need to be yourself. You need to be genuine. And just. And, bl and that blackness does not only come in one kind of body. Blackness comes in a variety of ways. So I believe that if I were to talk to my kindergarten self, I would tell him. Um, I could also add on to that. Okay. So I would basically um, tell my kindergarten self um, to always um, love yourself, um, embrace your blackness, embrace your culture, ethnicity, be proud of your roots, your family, your friends educate those who don't know that much about black history or like the impacts racism can have on a student or a person for the rest of their life. So I would basically just tell my kindergarten self to be educated, educate others and always love yourself and love others. Thank you so much for that. Uh, no problem. Okay, so we have to get to another question because I feel really bad because we told you we were finished at 2.30, but we have two other questions. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask the youth at a, another time, just please write them in the chat and then we'll get back to you at, a, at a, another date. Um, well, soon. So, Karen. Thank you yes. so much. I really appreciate the invitation to be here and what a phenomenal opportunity to listen all the youth on the call. I'm an educator and I spend a lot of time kind of pushing and asking for data within our school boards to get a sense of what youth are experiencing. And I think everyone on this call agrees that our students deserve to learn to their fullest potential. They deserve to learn an environment that is safe and free of discrimination, free from discrimination. I was wondering in any of your schools, do you have any knowledge about your schools, your school boards tracking incidents of anti-Black racism? Have you ever had an opportunity to weigh in on any kind of a survey or census asking if you've experienced racism, discrimination, what it looks like? Um, have you ever had a chance to 
kind of weigh in on that because I know there's always that discussion to push to report, but what gets done with it and are the right questions being asked? So I'm just wondering if you have any experiences with that. Thank you for the time for the question. Hi, so I can answer this one. I remember doing those surveys from time to time, actually. But the interesting thing is they were kind of blanket statement questions. They weren't specifically targeted towards uh, anti-Black racism. They were kind of blanket statements like, do you feel comfortable? Uh, not really targeted towards what makes you feel uncomfortable? What are the things you're experiencing in the classroom that need changes? That being said, I think there does need to be a certain more pinpointed focus on certain things so that you can really get the full answer and you can really find out what specifically needs to change instead of just having a blanket overall, oh, the board needs to change, for example. Um, to add on to what Dream was saying, I clearly, vividly remember viewing one of these board surveys in grade six. And during there was a section on, you know, have you faced any of these? And it had a list of things like, um, you know, have you ever been like sexually harassed? Is there racism? Is there this? Is there that? I remember very clearly clicking on racism, on sexual harassment, and on bullying. And my teacher, who was re who was walking around the lab pod, came, saw what I was saying, and said to me, "Do you really think that that's happening in our school?" And I unchecked all those boxes, even though all those things were most definitely happening at the school. So I feel like it. We do need data, but it's how it's collected. Because as a student, that's a perfect example, as a 12-year-old grade six student, my voice was silenced by my teacher kind of questioning my feelings. And that could be happening to so many other students who they're doing this in class. And it's supposed to be you fill out how you feel, but they're being watched and they're being hovered over. Maybe a classmate's looking over at them and saying, why are you putting that down? That doesn't happen here. So the method of data collection um, surveys, it doesn't always have the results that you really want to have all student voices, which is why I personally think that, like I said earlier, coming into the schools and having someone that we know, someone that, you know, I know in um, the York Region District School Board, there's the Black graduation coaches. I've, I've worked with them and I know some people on this panel have worked with them before. They're so easy to talk to they are so great. And honestly, if they came in and they asked me or if they asked any really black student about, hey, hey, what's going on? I would feel feel open to talk to them about that. So I feel like this board needs to really put in that work to have people that we feel comfortable talking to, to come in and to really ask us what's going on so that they get a genuine answer from us. Thank you for that. I mean, so we have our last question um, from Dr. Um, Sinclair. Hi, welcome. Um, thank you, God. I am enjoying this evening so much <laughs> hearing from my black young people. It is, you know, these are the potential um, prime minister and, 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 and premiers. I have a, my, 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 and thank you for the invitation. Mine is not a question so much as a challenge. Um, last year, York Region District School Board, we appointed an Indigenous trustee and a student Indigenous trustee. And um, because it's always hard, you know, it's hard for our Black students to get nominated. And we just appointed them. So my challenge to you as a, as a group is to send a letter to the board, and I will champion it, um, to have a black student trustee at the York Region District School Board might be our first in the province, but I think that's the challenge. You guys send and I, you guys send in a request, and I will definitely champion it and make sure that we get a black student trustee on the York Region District School Board. And that's all I have to say. I'm happy for all of you and keep it up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that, Dr. Sinclair. And I want to challenge the any youth that are listening on Facebook or Instagram or sorry YouTube um, to do the same for the Catholic Board as well, because we do need um, a um, trustee, a student trustee that is Black and Indigenous as well. So um, yeah, I 
It's um, 245 and I'm really, really, really sorry that we went over, but I think um, the youth had a lot to say and um, that they wanted to share. And also there's a lot of questions that people had. So please, um, again, feel free to email us. Um, uh, Vanessa, I don't know if you want to put up our, yeah, our information. So you can always, if you have any questions, um, reach us at any of these. And our email is in the chat. Um, and again, I think I know most of the people on this call. So if you have any questions, if you want to get in touch with the youth, you can always come through me as well. So um, I just want to thank everybody for coming um, to this um, this great event. There is a lot to be done. And as um, Dr. Sinclair said, you know, these are going to be our future prime ministers and, and ministers and and um, that most of them want to be lawyers and a lot of them want to be doing a lot of things within um, our community and are really dedicated to social justice. So again, I want to thank the panelists for coming. I want to and thank all the representatives from the different school boards um, um, for coming to, the, to this and thank you for joining. And um, obviously I want to thank the panelists. Um, thank you for, for um, your very truthful and candid um, conversation on how anti-Black racism has impacted you. And again, thank you for um, the police, um, oh, York, York Region District, sorry, your, the um, YRP for attending as well. So again, thank you. And um, you'll be hearing from us soon. And again, reach out to us and they have a lot to say. So thank you so, so, so much.